Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemroff, and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have enough time to watch all the videos we post on the Collider Videos YouTube channel or to read everything that goes up on Collider.com and you want some of the best of the best right in one nice, neat little spot. So this week, obviously a very hot topic was Suicide Squad. Before we roll into one of the news stories we covered, let's get a brief preview of the Heroes panel doing a spoiler-free review of the movie. All right, well, you're hearing, a, like Batman vs Superman, you're hearing a lot of divided opinion over this. And having seen the movie, I understand why. I totally get why there's divided opinion. The movie is a hot mess from a narrative point of view. Uh, I was telling Amy beforehand, it's kind of like a 300 piece puzzle on a table and it's all messed up all around the table. And that's that's kind of Suicide Squad in a nutshell. The story isn't all that great, not a super compelling villain. And yet underneath, all of that at its core fundamentals, it is a fun movie. I gotta say, I really, really liked this movie You liked a lot. it even more than yeah, I did. I almost say mm -hmm. I love this movie because, you know, with, with even the, the, the slightly disjunctive narrative that they had going on and some scenes really didn't fit, for me, like the things that I didn't like were like so minimal for myself. Like they had these two fight scenes with these boogly eyed creatures that got I call to them me, the putties, the, the power putties, Ranger yeah. putties. They're yeah. basically just like replaceable Ultron robots. It's one of those things where there's the state, there's no stakes. So for me, I get bored when I'm like, oh, they're shooting more of them. There's cool shots. There's the really cannon cool. fodder henchmen. Yes, exactly. So that to me for myself was the, the parts that I was like, Oh, because I want to see more character development. I want to see more Harley and Joker. I loved yeah. the dynamics between Jared Leto and Margot Robbie. They were they were fantastic. Margot Robbie kills this as Harley Quinn. I thought from the opening sequences with her where I was like, oh, I don't know if her humor is really fitting in. And then you instantly lock in as like, cause she's really insane. <laughs> So not only was that only a fraction of the review done on Heroes this week, but we also have a full non-spoilers review and a spoilers review up as well, so please go check those out. Now let's move on over to Movie Talk, where one of the news stories they covered regarding Suicide Squad was the news that dropped that Warner Brothers had been working on dual cuts of the film. I think it's a bit of a panic button sometimes. And when they see what happened with Batman v Superman, and they see some of the complaints, that they go, oh, wait a minute, let's let's get all these cooks in the kitchen. And you get David Aaron, who has traditionally worked on the darker side of things in his film. So you and you see that first initial trailer at Comic Con last year for Suicide Squad, you assume it's gonna be a little darker mm -hmm. and you kinda need it to be with some fun in it as mm -hmm. well. But this to me seems like this second cut that they did was more studio notes. I bet you that if you got David Ayer alone in a room. And he would tell you, mm, I think that I would have liked to have done this, this, and this different. Because some of the things that I saw in that particular film didn't feel like David Ayer to me. They felt like studio notes. Sort of unfortunate that we have this trigger, like Warner Brothers is like undecided about how they want to approach their cinematic universe is how it feels to me. Uh, they're reactionary. They have David Ayer, who's a completely different director than Zack Snyder. And they hired him to do a job. And then because of the effect of another film, they took his film away and we're like, we have to add this, we gotta take this away, we gotta do that. And to have dueling cuts is just probably a nightmare situation. I would hope that we actually see this other cut in a circumstance like on the Blu-ray, like we got to see the Ultimate Edition. Right. Um, but I also wanna have the theatrical cut as well because I did enjoy it, I did have a fun time. And I totally understand the studio's concerns. We're like, we can't release two really dark, dour movies in a row. So I'm extra excited about this week's Jedi Council portion of Best of the Week because I got to be on the show. So thank you again, Christian, for having me on. We talked about a whole bunch of great stuff, but the portion of the show that we're gonna highlight right now is the news that dropped that Tony Gilroy is supervising the edit of Rogue One. There is a scenario that they were working on a movie that they weren't completely happy with. They did these reshoots and they all came together in the room and said, this is what can make the movie work. Let's implement that by putting in someone that, that uh, Gareth Edwards is comfortable with and it's a very positive spin. I think that you made a great point, which is you do from sometimes. Time to time. Every once in a while, one out of every six ones. We still haven't seen a full trailer for this movie, so I think one of the primary focuses of the reshoots might have been we need a couple good money shots. Yeah. We need a couple things that are really going to wow people, that are going to get people into the theater. So it wasn't just reshooting the movie, it was also let's get something that really pops, that really sizzles in a trailer selling this film. I do agree with you. I think it, it, I want to see a trailer. It, it's a little odd that we don't have one yet, but I'm going to start focusing on, I mean, it's Thursday and we have another story about Rogue One. Yeah. It's a positive thing for me because Tony Gilroy is an Oscar-nominated director and a writer for Michael Clayton. He's worked on the Bourne franchise with 
uh, Kathleen Kennedy's husband, and he worked with Gareth Edwards in my opinion, to great success with Godzilla. Yeah, buddy. The only thing in the Variety story, in Variety, a Hollywood Reporter story that is kind of making me a little nervous is the line, now he is said to be supervising the edit with input from Edwards. I don't like the phrasing with input from Edwards because now I'm picturing Tony Gilroy front and center looking at the computer, dictating everything, and Edwards sitting in the back being, being like, eh. <laughs> On Collider Nightmares this week, we were talking about those leaked set photos from American Horror Story Season 6 that suggest that the theme of Season 6 could be the Roanoke Colony, which is a colony from the 16th century that just vanished. It's important to note that this is completely unconfirmed by FX, and even if this colony is part of the new season, who knows if it's actually the full theme. So let's check out our discussion on this. A couple of years ago, Halloween Horror Nights Orlando did an original maze that was Roanoke. And basically their take on the Lost Colony, which actually is a fascinating story that could be spun into urban legend as well, their take was cannibals. Ooh. Their take was everybody ate each other, mm. which I kind of love. Um, and I'm not <laughs> saying that that's, you know, the general consensus or what American Horror Story will do, but I do, in a way, kind of love the idea of going back to one of the oldest American horror mysteries. I love these colonies that just disappear and they vanish and there's just, there's something carved in the tree and that's all you get. So it opens up the world a lot more. So, and I like the idea, especially pilgrims and I mean we we uh, we could do supernatural we could do slaughter we could do cannibalism there's a lot of of opportunities there like you guys name really good ways that they could take this like the cannibal thing that sounds really cool yeah but my brain that's saturated in previous seasons of American Horror Story tells me that even if you have one really great idea to expand this sure. they're not just gonna go with cannibals totally. they're gonna go cannibals and aliens and yeah. whatever else they yeah. can Ooh, come aliens. up with <laughs> <laughs> all, but all in one season sounds like a big fat mess. Yeah. To me. You know, when you were mentioning Pilgrims, I was like, that wouldn't be bad. Yeah. Do 10 episodes, you know, with a bunch of weird Puritans. I mean, that's freakishly scary just thinking about that's it. That's what I'm thinking. But uh, they're probably not going to do that. So you're right. It prob probably is like flashback scenes. It's got me intrigued, though. Anything with Pilgrims is frightening. This week's top 10 show topic is superhero villains. What scored the top spot? I'm not going to tell you, but let's check out Roca and Nost impromptu discussion about Lex Luthor. Um, There's I not figured... been a good Lex Luthor yet. An, yeah. A, an authentically good Lex Luthor. Gene Hackman's fantastic in the Superman films. It's not Lex Luthor, he's, but he's fantastic. Yeah, but films. it's a different It's a different Lex entirely. Exactly. This is here for comedic relief. Yeah, just like uh, foil. Eisenberg and Batman vs. Superman. It's not the Lex Luthor that I recognize. It is not my Lex Luthor. I just don't think we're ever going to get the comic book version, which is a truly... It's a person I side with. Yeah. It's a person that makes sense to me as an adult. As a kid, I was like, oh, you know, why try and stop Superman? Even yeah. though I didn't really read the comic all that much. And as an adult, I'm like, yeah, if there's a God living here on Earth and yeah. he could do whatever he wants at any time, maybe we should think about how to stop him if he doesn't like well, us. Well, and that's the thing that's great about Lex Luthor. And when they do it right, when they actually do it right, and I think maybe they'll do it after Justice League when Superman finally gets his own film again and has, doesn't have to share the screen with another superhero, I think it'd be great to, to bring back Lex Luthor and make it be. But unfortunately, I mean, you'd have to get rid of Jesse or bring in Brian Cranston to actually be the Lex Luthor we're talking about. Because Luthor, the, the, if you do. Is Luther correctly, Luther is supposed to be a human being who is representing us against a god, and yeah. you're supposed to you're supposed to begrudgingly find logic or acceptance of his logic to a degree in his madness, and that is true because we wouldn't know what a god could do. Someone would have to predict that if a god flips, anything could happen. Yeah, without a doubt. I yeah. mean, it's it's. It makes sense logically when you look at it from our perspective as the sheep. Yeah. That it could be led to the yeah. slaughter at any point. Exactly. That's well, As an adult reading that now, I'm like, that's a great villain. I yeah. have never seen that villain. See, I didn't mind Kevin Spacey's. I didn't like the movie as a whole. Yeah. But I thought he could actually pull it off. Okay. Just because uh, the other thing I like about Luthor is he, you know, jabs the knife in your mm -hmm. back and likes to watch you as he twists yes, it a little. Yes, he does. Let's roll into the interview section of the show. First up, we're going to highlight an interview I did with Josh Makuka. We had Scott Wolf come into the studio, who looks exactly the same as he did on Party of Five, which I love. And he's right now on a show called The Night Shift, which is on NBC. It's a doctor drama. So he told us a little bit about what doctor skills he's picked up from making the show. I do, I do uh, annoyingly, you know, uh, amateurishly diagnose my friends and family and, you know <laughs> my, and it's funny because my kid my my oldest son is seven oh, perfect. and he's got a father uh, he's got a friend in school i would hope he has a father <laughs> he has a father yeah, that's good. i don't i'm not familiar with who that is but uh so he's got a friend at school whose dad is, is a real doctor uh, and i hear about that now. Yes. you know it's like it's not cool that his dad's an actor it's like 
<laughs> his dad is a real doctor. Yeah. And so the other day he had like a splinter in his hand and I was like, sit still, I'm gonna get this out. And he was kind of really upset already. And finally he at one point it like hurt him and he was like, you're not a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to jump back into some Comic-Con coverage with this second interview. While at Comic-Con, Steve got to talk to John Watts, who's the director of Spider-Man Homecoming. And during their chat, they talked a little bit about the tech-based approach to the Vulture costume. In the artwork that you released and in the footage, we see our first look at Vulture. And it's clear that he has a mechanic, like there's those Tony Stark-esque kind of like propulsion, you know, spinny. Yeah. How would you describe that? Uh... Well, it's a very sort of tech-based approach to how the vulture would build a wingsuit and how he would fly. Um, and it's not just cool design, it's, uh, it's a big part of the story. So that I can't give away, but we, uh, there's some cool stuff that goes along with that. Well, was it always going to be like a tech-based vulture? Was there ever talk of doing like a metahuman or, you know what I mean? Um, from the very beginning, uh, we wanted to try to keep it tech-based, just to keep it different initially from uh, what we had seen before. Just getting away from any anything that was too similar to Spider-Man, and and it sets up a really cool thing that I don't want to talk about yet. Uh, but they sort of work hand in hand um, to uh, to and led to that eventual vulture suit design. So I was this close to highlighting the Superman Badonkadonk conversation on this section of TV talk, but because that's in the large majority of the blooper reel, let's talk about Game of Thrones, because HBO confirmed it this week. The eighth season will be the last. How did the TV talk panel feel about it? Let's check it out. I think this is great news. I always am a fan of shows ending when they're when they when they want to end, when they're ready to end. If there's a story that they're finished with, a story that they've told that they're confident with, end it. Uh, Stephen tonight did it with Spartacus. He was actually given two more seasons that stars gave him here. You, we'll let you make two more seasons to make more money. He's like, nah, I want to end it after uh, three with, with a miniseries. I'm done after that. I think Breaking Bad ended at, with its highest ratings. Sopranos, I think, maybe went a little too long. I think some certain shows could, if they end early, can be better. That's why I'm afraid about The Walking Dead. I know people always say, David, The Walking Dead's based off a comic book series. Comic books go on forever. It's like, I know. That's not a good I thing. I know. It's not, <laughs> in TV world, that's not a good thing for TV world. In comic book world, it works fine because you're reading something that takes you 10 minutes to read and then it's done. I just really hope that, you know, we get to the eighth episode and they don't, or the eighth season, the final episode, and they don't Sopranos, Sopranos us. You know what just I mean? Fade to, just cut to black. Just black. Cut, like, you're a dragon. <laughs> and then black. <laughs> they won't do that. They understand. They have delivered time and again. It's going to be fine. I mean, this is sad because there will be this. I, we will mourn this loss. I will yeah. sit Shiva for this show <laughs> because it has been my friend, my companion, my loyal stalwart for all yes. these seasons. And I will definitely miss it. But I'm grateful that they're going out the way they are. I am also grateful that now I have 13 more episodes to prepare myself for mm -hmm. that. Because if you penny dreadful me and suddenly <laughs> the show ends and they're like the end. And I'm just like, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like they almost like did that to us. Breaking up over text. If you, you don't watch the, if you don't watch the Nick, I feel like they did that to us in season two of the Nick. I still think that they I might th come back for the next season three. That, I mean, nothing's been confirmed, but I feel mm -hmm. like they may have done that to us in the Nick. Now let's move over to the Collider.com portion of the show, when we get to highlight some written features done by the gang over there. We're kicking things off with a big feature from Allison Keene. She did a complete ranking of HBO's drama series. You might be able to guess what my number one would be, but you're going to have to check out Allison's piece to find out what came out on top for her. Next up, we've got a spoiler-filled article for you. Season one of Preacher just wrapped up, so Chris Cabin wrote a piece about how the show deviates from the source material and what we could wind up seeing next season. Yet another spoilery TV article for you. Ten lingering questions we want answered in Stranger Things Season 2. That is, if Season 2 is ever confirmed, and it better be Netflix or I'm gonna lose it. You also might have noticed the play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child recently opened on the West End in London, and Collider's Katie Burke got the chance to check it out. She wrote about why the question, who is the Cursed Child, might be tougher to answer than you might expect. And lastly for .com, another huge feature from Brian Formo. He ranked all of the Best Actress winners of the 2000s from worst to best. So that's 2000 to 2009, which means we're talking about Julia Roberts and Aaron Brockovich to Sandra Bullock in The Blind Side. On this week's Schmodown, we have our very own Christian Harloff going up against Jason Inman. Only one of these guys can claim a spot in the ultimate Schmodown, so let's check out a preview of how the match went down. I need to win. I haven't won a match, singles match, in two years, 
That's uh, it's sad. This is like Star Wars facing Star Trek, right? It's equal battles. If a movie is good, it doesn't matter. We all win. Gray Drake was no slouch, and Inman did really well. The question is, what does he know besides comic book movies? Introducing Jason Justice Inman! Oh, and here comes Inman. He's dressed, he's that. got... He's got a, wow. what is that, a suit? Oh, no. Look, oh, oh he's, got got a, he's got a phase gun. He's got yeah. a phase gun. And the reigning movie trivia showdown team champion, <laughs> Christian Dark Harlem. Yeah. He's been a lot more friendly than his match with Andy Signor. Yeah. And in which acclaimed movie will you find a wolf named Two Socks? Two Socks. In which acclaimed movie will you find a wolf in name? I'm, I'm making a guess. Dances with Wolves? That is correct. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 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 In movie taglines, name the film <laughs> featuring the tagline, even a hitman deserves a second shot. Uh, gross point blank. <laughs> that is correct. Give the man a point. <laughs> It's Meme of the Week time, the point in the show when we get to highlight a great piece of artwork or a meme you guys sent in that was inspired by one of our shows. This week's winner is Ricardo Vargas, who made me and Mark Riley two very happy people this week with these memes. That picture of me hugging Jason is pretty eerily real looking. I think my mom approves. So thank you so much, Ricardo, for sending those in. We absolutely love them. If you want your meme featured on this show, Pick a moment from one of our shows, make some cool art, make a meme, and then send it on into mailbag at Collider.com, or you can tweet it at us using the hashtag Collider Best of the Week. It's finally time. It's blooper time, guys. Are you ready for... Are you kidding, Sinead? We're taping a show. The picture that broke the internet is Tyler Hecklin's Badonk. Like, we need to call him Super Donk. Which takes place in the 1920s and follows Mazajuju's... Mazajuzoologist. You know, this movie sucks. Oh, yeah, it's, that it's ass pretty is big. the ass that sank the Titanic. Damn. Sorry, Mrs. Griffin, but you know you like it. <laughs> Mark Ellis, or Mark Ellis. <laughs> We wow. will leave you with your What's previously scheduled uh, <laughs> <laughs> weird Padme, Anakin, sexual tension, forced oh. sexual tension from the first I, uh, Phantom I, Menace. I, yeah, because well, there was that weird, <laughs> creepy stuff at the end with Marissa Tomei and Tom Holland. That was a little weird and creepy at the end of Civil War. I so can't believe that's where your mind went. The movie was itself. The movie was. <laughs> the mud moot but Variety reports that I need to start over. I'm like having a fucking thing. <laughs> You know what? I got a Wood Ranch salad to eat. Let's get this going, please. It is butt alicious. Google it. Google it right now. You never know what happens with the moms. There's always referred to it. You're it's a sick, sick person. <laughs> I'm just You're a I want sick. to see I the mom die. You, know see. No, you talk saying. about sexual tension <laughs> with Black Widow no, and Spider Man. You, know. you talk about pedophilia <laughs> with, with Jeets. My zoologist. My zoologist. My zoologist. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, I still have no idea. It uh, uh, <laughs> scared me. It's so crazy. <laughs> I thought it was like the government coming after me to take me away. Oh, oh I got kissed by John Campia. Oh. While all signs point towards a second season, Netflix bought Tez Hawk. The series featured historical figures such as Wild Bill Hillcock, Calamity Jane oh, yeah. Hickok. It's your favorite word. You want to say it? Hick Cock. You're right. I need to stop doing that, by the way. My cock montage, where just take it from the butt. Yeah, because it will probably happen. Just take it from the butt. I recommend you take it from the butt. I like the photos that were leaked online with him and his badonka donk. I, 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 I do enjoy those. Not because of his butt, but uh, as a black man, I do admire it. This new remake. I can't say fucking remake. This new remake will. I can't fucking do it. To get. See, fuck you. Barbecue chicken wood ranch salad. Which tastes very good. I'm just saying, butt chops. So I'm guessing you could drink on that thing and it would not move. While you have Natasha. Agua? Sorry. I don't know. Singing. I guess it was a song during the. While you have Natasha Adla singing, that's not cool. Rolling. Ooh. Hey, 
Sorry, as a black man, let me tell you how I am the badonk I can't say badonk donk the, the rest of the audience is they're agreeing. They're, with it. they're right, agreeing. Right. And I know they just went on a whole time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like you so, and by, by the way, I know. <laughs> No ruffles. Where's my onion dip, bitch? Yep. True. Oh, buns of steel, you okay. guys. Buns of steel. And that's a wrap on Collider Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Hit the comment section below and share some of your favorite moments from this week's lineup of shows. I am Perry Nemroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at pnemroff. Please go over and bookmark Collider.com. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Watch and read everything, but just in case you don't have time, that's what Best of the Week is for. Have a good weekend, everyone. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.